Hey everybody, this is Abate. Today we'll be talking to the co-founder and CEO of Open Bionics, Joel Gibbard. So Open Bionics, if you're not super familiar with them, they make these very customized prosthetic limbs. Um, they generally target so younger demographics like children, and they've made these really amazing partnerships with firms like Disney and Lucasfilm, um, where they've been able to make these custom prosthetic limbs that you know, fit into some of these like superhero themes and really capture the imagination of the youth. So tune in to find out more. Welcome to the Robo Podcast. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. So um, I actually, to, to tell you a little bit of background, I actually uh, have been around your company for quite a bit. Um, I know you guys are based out in the UK. I think uh, if you could just give a little bit of background about what you guys um, are doing and, and who you are, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So our company is called Open Bionics and we are making bionic arms for people with upper limb differences. And we, we've, we've been working on trying to bring technologies like 3D scanning, 3D printing, 3D design to the prosthetics industry and bring the benefits along with them. So it's a great technology for custom manufacture of custom products. Every single prosthesis is bespoke to the individual. Um, and so we're working on trying to make that scalable, really high quality and bring with it user benefits, like being able to make prosthetics really lightweight, mm -hmm. um, which is incredibly important and having a bit more flexibility on the aesthetic design as well, which is also really, really important. Yeah, yeah, no, your team has definitely built a, a really fun product in a, in a space that's like generally not that fun, you know? Um, so big kudos on that. Uh, what about yourself? Well, give us a little background on your own history. So my, um, my uh, interest, so I, I, I got really, really interested in robotics when I was younger. So teenage years, uh, even before that, I was constantly obsessed with Lego Technic and building robots and, and um, radio control cars and things like that. Um, and then that took me to wanting to study robotics at university, which is what I did, studied at University of Plymouth. It was one of the first um, universities actually offering a degree in robotics. Mm -hmm. and, um, and during that time, I began uh, get, getting interested in robotic hands I think, I think that's like a, a rite of passage for um, people that get interested in robotics is, is like becoming interested by biomimetic robotics. And mm -hmm. so you've got loads of cool stuff there, like hexapod, ro hexapod robots and, um, you know, ornithopters and stuff like that. But for me, that was robotic hands was where, where that, that really developed an interest. Um, and I think it was something about the, I think I deemed the the dexterity of human hands as one of the things that enabled m me to 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 do a lot of the things that I love doing and I think that's why it fascinated me so much. So I started looking into that, started researching the applications for it and got really captivated by the the idea of of bionic hands and and the products that were coming to market at that time which was like 2008 like 2007, 2008, 2009, they were the first bionic hands coming to market. So it was it was a really exciting time for for that kind of technology in the industry. And so mm -hmm. I so I did a, a pro, my final year project with my um, my undergrad degree was was making a robotic hand. Yeah, yeah, and just to you know give us a picture of like what 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 was the history of robotic hands. Up until that point, I think you mentioned around 2000, 2007, 2008 is when you did your degree. Um, and then, you know, 3D printing, obviously, you know, it, it enabled your company partially, as well as uh, a lot of other people in this space for like working with um, biological systems that, that have a lot more variability from one to the other. So what was that history like from, the, say, the, the early 2000s, late 1990s um, into the, the 2010s? Well, from well, yeah. For, I'll speak from my from my perspective of it. But the so it was a, it was the exact same time that two thousand nine, I think, was the RepRap project. So it's, it was the exact same time that desktop three D printing was was gaining in popularity as well. And so that's why that's why that that the the merge of those technologies was really 
I mean, kind of felt obvious at that point. But uh, but yeah, so in terms of the prosthetics industry, the there's this underlying technology, myoelectric control, which has which has been around for a really long time, since like the 70s, which is where we have electrodes that detect signal from muscles. Same kind of thing as ECG that's detecting heart rates, really similar kind of uh, technology, but the electrical signals it develops are coming straight off the muscles. Uh, and it can be any muscle, not just the, the heart. So we use it for the muscles in the forearm to control the, the hand. So that technology had been around for a while and had really kind of made its way into the prosthetics industry, but it was controlling really, really simple devices. So it's like a effectively a claw that opened and closed. Sometimes it was made to look like a claw. Sometimes it was made to look like a hand, but it was just a really, really simple terminal device. So the, uh, since like early 2000s, Touch Bionics in Scotland started started working on um, that. Well, actually, it was way earlier than that that the project really. I, that I believe the project originally started, but then started becoming a company and started bringing product to market, and and that was one of the first ones to have multi articulating joints. So every single finger had its own motor, and they could move independently and have have different grip modes. Would that be coming from different parts of the arm that you would control each of the digits individually, like different muscles are each doing their own control? So yeah, so that would that would make sense, but that that still hasn't been perfected. So at that point, it was still a two-channel control system, um, and indeed our product still has a two-channel control system. So one sensor to open the hand, one sensor to close the hand. So. You can then change between different grip modes to get the hand to do different things, but the control inputs, while quite intuitive, are also quite basic because it's proportional power, but just open and close. So some really cool work going on, has been going on for, for the last decade or so in trying to go way beyond that and have much finer dexterity. And it's uh, it's just been a really hard problem to solve because not everyone's muscle physiology after having had a, a, an amputation or being born with a congenital limb difference is the same. And so with things like machine learning that have become way more established now, I think that the, the technologies can improve there exponentially. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, because on one hand, you know, you've built a, a hardware platform that can adapt to different the variations in the biological systems and like 3D printing has enabled that. But the software is also um, the control system actually also needs to catch up and be able to adapt to just a, a wide variety of signals that they can get. Um, but as it stands right now, like just having this two channel uh, communication that is pretty established across like a variety of different amputee types um, like the reasons behind why they're amputated. Yeah, yeah. And we find that we can get that system to work with the vast, vast majority of patients. So, so that's always the, always the challenge. And then this, and you mentioned like the control system and dexterity of the hands. There's also the feedback and that's something for the future. Even it's not in, there's not really, there's not like, I'd say particularly well mapped sort of feedback at the moment on any um upper limb prosthetics but that's another thing so so people can feel through the prosthesis so the the, the challenge with it is that it's uh, there's lots of complexity to to how to how to how to kind of create yeah. all of the functionality and sensations that you want to um and uh and in, in a really small space and something that's really lightweight and something that's totally custom made yeah yeah so do you guys have a software angle to this product as well? We, yeah, so there's actually two software angles. Um, so there's the, the one which is our parametric computer-aided design system that we use to design each hero arm, um, which is kind of the, 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 uh, the, the, the back end to how we, how we customize each hero arm. And then the other one is we've got an app which is a companion app for the hero arm. So it enables people to do uh, different like grip modes. They can, uh, they can configure, configure it. Um, and we've also built into that training guides and training aids. 
so that when somebody gets their hero arm, right, we've got the instruction for use and the quick start guide and the manuals and everything. And we don't necessarily believe that everybody is going to read through all of those. So, but we, we've had a lot of success with people engaging with the app, which has all of the information in there, but it's really like walkthroughs, it's interactive, it's re actually responding to the muscle signals um, and kind of coaching people through the process of learning how to operate it. And mm -hmm. so we built, we built that out this year and from a, from sort of a foundational technological standpoint, th this was a forward thinking move because as we introduce new functionality, we've got that channel to continuously um, make sure that everybody knows how to, how to utilize any new features that we roll out. So yeah, yeah. I mean, so what's interesting there is, uh, so you mentioned earlier around, you know, some developments around um, being able to control motors through like muscle signals and um, potentially even having like some machine learning algorithms that can really make this thing adaptable from one person to the other. So in theory, could those um, ML models be running on the iPhone itself and then uh, just getting those muscle signals, et cetera, from uh, the from the arm itself so it's just sort of like linked and passing that over bluetooth and then doing some of the specialized control that way nice idea um <laughs> i don't want to don't want to say no but my my uh, my instinct is that the the latency would be too high with bluetooth but i might be wrong um but the the along those lines is it, what we were thinking with the with the app and the, and the and the Bluetooth connectivity was so we can we can do now over the air firmware updates for the hero arms for the fleet of hero arms in the field so and we we also have um, like anonymous ag, ag, aggregate what's the word aggregated uh, data data um, collection going on so we, we so we get much better information about how they're being used. Um, so this, this was kind of the thinking was like setting us up in a position long term to be able to do some of these really cool things that we've not had the bandwidth to do in the past. And mm -hmm. when we do pull them off, then being able to roll them out to all of the arms that everybody has at that moment. Yeah, yeah. So I, I imagine there's uh, maybe uh, there's certainly a microcontroller in each of these uh, arms. And then is there a, a computer as well in there, like a microprocessor or anything? There is, there's three, so each electrode has one and the hand has one. But with the with the current um, design, we've uh, we've kind of my understanding is that we've pretty much maxed out the the available power. Or I don't know if it's related to memory or power, but either way, it's it's got it's got to the point mm -hmm. where uh, a major a major thing like um, machine learning patterns we couldn't do with the current um, hardware, but there's lots of things that we can do, like for example, new grip modes, um, other, other, other kind of new control inputs. So that's, that's something that we're now perfectly positioned mm -hmm. to be able to do in an incremental way, introduce new features. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not super familiar with the space, but where are people like where the the is the research for this happening, and uh, are you guys just eagerly watching from a distance until you know the the technology catches up and you can turn that um, fold that into your business? In some in some areas we are, and in others we are very proactive. So, but because it's you know it's a it's a niche segment, and there's there's so there's still so far to go. You do have to like pick and choose your battles. Um, if you if you actually want to get something to market, you can't you can't sort of do it all. Um, and so there are there are different people focusing on different things. And one of the things that we've chosen to focus on is the the um, aut automating to the extent that we can the customization process of making each arm. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we've that we've been we've done really effectively with the hero arm and. That's that's been a major change to the way that the the products delivered because we've got one integrated design for a prosthesis that is sort of delivered and fit to the patient, whereas 
most of the market works on the basis that the the clinician buys components and then makes hand or with with their workshop and their te- technical team hand makes the prosthesis mm-hmm. at, at the place where it's being delivered yeah yeah and, and you know what your team has done on, on the um the physical design side you know it, it's it's really amazing um very very fun designs could you like describe what they look like um for people do you have some around you sure i, I don't have i'm at home at the moment so I, I i often do have a bionic arm kicking around but not right now um but uh, yes the design is is um so we use so we have a 3d printed frame um for which we use um multi-jet fusion hp's multi-jet fusion printers so it's like a it's a black nylon is what it comes out like and it's um and we have like an open core design so it it's 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 ventilated and it's lightweight on the basis that it's not completely solid hmm. so that's like the basic frame but then on the outside we have these covers that you put on over the top they attach magnetically so you can change the aesthetic day to day and those are, are much more customized in the way that they look so we have all different colors and we even gone so far as to work with companies like Disney and Marvel and Lucasfilm to get licenses to make the Iron Man covers. Um, And so you can have your bionic arm look like Iron Man's arm. And the idea behind that was that for, for kids in particular, although uh, it's, it's definitely of interest to, to some of our adult patients as well, but for, for kids in particular, they can, they can overcome something that they might have looked at for, um, you know, looked at from through through the lens of being self conscious about their their difference, and flip that around to being something that they're kind of really proud to show off, and everybody's jealous of. So that's worked really really well. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really amazing for a startup. You know, um, you guys are well now seven years old, so um, been around for quite some time. But to be able to set up partnerships like Lucasfilm. Uh, Disney, like these are things that really uh, unlock um, your access to like people's imaginations and then therefore customers. How did you how did you go about getting those partnerships? It's a great question. And I think it's a really unorthodox route that we took because I remember like 2013, even before open, even before we founded Open Bionics, reaching out, I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, it was, it, I, I reached out, just found the right person or what I thought was the right person to email at, uh, at Marvel to ask the question. And, uh, they, I just got like a stock lawyer response saying no kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and then, but we, we, we didn't really let go of the idea. And then an opportunity arose for us to participate in the Disney accelerator. Um, which was a mm. program that ran for a few years. Not sure if they still do it, but it's definitely changed a lot since we did it. But they would take on startups, 10 startups per year with the intention of then forging relationships and, and licensing agreements that would then that would then last last a long time thereafter. So we were really, really lucky to to get get a chance to participate on that program because for the most part it was commercially driven, I would say. So they were looking for companies making toys that they could then license or other, other kind of re- lots of really interesting products as well, but things that they typically would look to, um, look, look to, to, to use in their parks or in different products that they were looking at doing. But with us, they looked at it for different reasons other than purely the, the commercial. So it's much more because they thought it was a really great thing to, to be involved with and to do. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I've seen uh, some of the uh, the marketing materials that you guys have put out. Um, you know, this this kid with uh, Black Panther, and he's got like his custom uh, uh, plates on, and then you know, um, a lot of movies also sort of have this cyborg type of um, character that that you can like really seamlessly uh, merge into these uh, prosthetic limbs. Yeah, that's that is it's been a popular theme in science fiction. We worked with Edos Montreal as well to get the, the Adam Jensen covers, which which look really cool. So 
um, people people kind of ask the question like, oh, can you make the the things like that? Can you make the Iron Man arm? Can you make the DSX arm? Not expecting the answer to be, oh yeah, yeah, we've we've done that <laughs> and we offer it. What's the craziest thing somebody requested? Oh, uh, we've had we've had loads of um, crazy requests from people. There's a, a lot of more sort of free thinking cust- of our of even of our customers our end users will ask for like e- e- extra human functionality from their prosthetics. So, um, <laughs> I mean, what was the yeah the taser? <laughs> Put right, a tas- <laughs> taser in it um, to. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are um, so. It's, there's more basic things as well, like Bluetooth speaker, USB storage, flashlight, those kind of things. Which, which you know, some of which we really have have considered and thought about. But but then there's the wild ones as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I deal with a lot of hardware, and every uh, year I get for Christmas uh, a bunch of little multi tools, and I can just imagine somebody you know requesting uh, a multi tool cyborg arm. <laughs> Yeah, like yes, I think for, for for us, like if there's there's probably certain things where it's it's supposed to be a general purpose um, tool for for activities of daily living. So it's not supposed to serve one specific utility. And there is a there are a lot of prosthetic limbs that are designed to serve one specific utility. Like you can get attachments for playing particular sports, for example. So, um, so I think that's where for us, we, we kind of, we decided to focus, to, fo- to, to mm-hmm. focus on, on trying to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so what is the target customer like then? So we've got, uh, we've got a wide range of, 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 of different kind of demographic in terms of, in terms of the patient base. Um, so, so the hero, so originally we, one of the one of the challenges we wanted to to solve was that there weren't when we launched the hero arm any bionic hands small enough to fit children at all and we were getting a lot of requests from from parents of children saying we want something for our for our child so we wanted to make something that was small and uh, the and then we the smallest we could go with the with the functionality was about the right size for an eight year old so that's what we managed to do and then that was obviously a the, the hero one was the only product available for those people. So that became our initial target market right at the very beginning. But, but since then it's shifted and now, now it's, um, there are far more adult hero arm users than children. So it really varies. And it, it it's, there are people that have had a congenital limb difference, grown up that way and have really learned to, do all of the things that they need to do day to day. And for them, often the benefit of the hero arm is predominantly psychological. And the, mm-hmm. and, and uh, it, it's, it, it's a bit, it's a bit different for them. And then there's other people where they've lost they maybe they've lost a limb later on in life and the benefit is predominantly functional and that's why they want it. And that's what they want to be able to do things that they haven't been able to adapt to, to, to pick back up after their limb loss so it's really it is really wide ranging Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i can definitely see that so you know back in uh, 2015 um i was actually doing my my master's degree in robotics in the bristol robotics lab oh fantastic Um, yeah yeah and uh what year uh 2015 so we were we were there together then yeah, we were there together. So I remember being in there. I had a, an internship in something completely different. Um, and just a lot of the people in that lab, there was this like energy around, you know, what you guys were building. It was very new back then. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it's been a fun experience. Uh, I'm seeing you guys from that point in the lab to, you know, where you're where you're at now. Um, you guys are currently raising money. Um, mm-hmm. How's the, How's the journey been like as a, as a company going from working in this shared uh, robotics lab in uh, in the southwest of England and then um, going to where you are now. Well, yeah, it's been it's been a 
wild journey, lots of challenges to, to overcome um, sort of year after year and, and changing each time as we, as we get through each, each stage of initially it was very technical product development challenges and then it became very regulatory and, and then more recently it became more commercial. So it's, it's kind of shapes along, along the journey. Um, but of course, yeah, it does uh, take a lot of investment. So what we've, what we've, the point that we've got to now is we've really established the business quite well. We've established the brand. We brought our first product to market, and we, we're incredibly proud of the of the progress that we've made and the impact that we've made through doing that. But we always want more. So the, the next thing is we want to increase the impact by bringing the hero arm to new countries, and then mm-hmm. also to to branch out into other product segments. So it's, we're looking, we continue to focus on upper limb prosthetics, but of course the hero arm's only for people with a transradial limb difference below elbow, but above wrist. And so there's there's opportunity to, to help people with other kinds of upper limb differences as well. And we'd like to be able to do that. So we, that's what we're raising money for right now is that uh, that growth and expansion. Um, so we've, we're, we're just about to launch a funding round, fund raising campaign on Crowdcube um, to to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, what, what countries are you looking to go into? What's the strategy behind choosing uh, which ones? It's the, so the strategy behind choosing it would be to look at the. So we look at the look at look at a market from the the, the numbers of uh, people is is typically quite. For most countries, it, it can be it can be a percentage of population, so it's quite tied to the population. And then the the, the specific variances to that would be like Ukraine right now, for example. There's there's a there's a disproportionately high number amount of limb loss. Um, but uh, in terms of but the the other thing that we look at is is the the delivery mechanism. So where how how well equipped the funding landscape is. That's major major factor. Is like can is there governmental funding available for these types of products and how is it, mm. how does that and work? Um, when you it, say governmental funding, sorry, when you say governmental funding, do you mean, uh, so like something like Medicare where it can like fund part of the purchase so that the customer doesn't have to bear the burden of the entire um, yeah. product? Exactly. Yeah. So, so, but the, the U S is probably one of the most, complicated in many ways um, but there there are certain european countries that are really that have really good funding availability for prosthetic products and then you've got uh, uk for example where the nhs has a really really great funding pathway for certain products and certain um certain certain things but for multi-grip bionic hands until recently they they just weren't they weren't offered they weren't funded at all uh, and so, and then even mm-hmm. recently they've, they, they've, they've changed that to that ruling. So they will be funded, but it remains to be seen how, how sort of, um, the criteria is applied to, to actually, t- to get people fitted. So how long it takes and, and then how that process plays out. So, so that's what one of the big things that we look at and, um, and then finally it would be, uh, well, not necessarily in this order, but the other thing would be regulatory. So for us, we've got the FDA registration and the CE mark. So any countries that are using the CE mark, it's, it's much easier from a regulatory standpoint to enter them. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And you said also that you were um, looking to branch into a couple of the other um, things that you can do where with upper limb, um, what, what would be some of those other things? Yeah. So we, we were trying to, not be too prescriptive around products right now because we, we we're always mm-hmm. going to try and start from really establishing the user requirements. Um, but so so I can talk more probably about the market segments that we're looking at rather than what the product is going to end up looking like. Mm-hmm. Um, and those would be so we can we can so we'll be looking at people with partial hand limb loss, for example, um, single digit finger limb loss as well. So. We, we, and we get a lot of inbound interest from, from these, from, from people who have seen the hero arm and love it and inquire as to whether we have something that might work for them. And then we have to say, 
No, in, in a lot of cases, because because the limitations, clinical limitations, are here on. So we want to we want to be able to make products that 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 help those people. So that's 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 kind of the way that we the way that we're looking at. So that's one area is uh, is different types types of 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 uh, limb differences from from the wrist down, and we also we're also looking at being able to offer a solution that that works for above elbow amputees. Um, and then a little bit further into the future, we're starting to look at whether there, like, there's a huge, huge, huge population of people who still have an arm, but have limited mobility or have paralysis. And so that's a, uh, that's a really, really interesting segment. We've had loads of inbound interest from, from people like that as well. And we know it's a huge market, but it's a little bit earlier. There's the, the, the funding is often less established the funding pathways are often less established and then from a product standpoint as well clinically things are, are, are a little bit less established as well so it's earlier on in in the in the in the stage of developments um and uh and what what we might end up making but that's something that we're really really excited about for longer term growth mm -hmm. yeah and you guys are currently raising on crowdcube um so uh, people like listeners as well. Um, anybody can go on go on to this uh, link and just invest in your company. Is that the idea? That's right. Yeah. So people, as long as they're not in the USA or Japan or Canada, um, uh, they they will be they will be able to to check it out and see if it's of interest. But uh, that's something that we're really excited about. Is with this opportunity, um, you know, this will be the first time that that people can buy shares in Open Bionics. And mm -hmm. that's, uh, we've had, again, something that people have asked for, like pretty much ever since we started the company and we've done these private rounds of investment, but we've never done anything before that would, would be, um, available to the general public. So we'd, we'd, we're really excited for that. Awesome. Yeah. We'll share the link in the, in the notes. Thank you for coming on here today, Joel. You're so welcome. Thank you very much for having me.